Welcome back to the Center of Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger K. Green. This is a contextualized reading of Book 12 of Homer's Odyssey for our course, uh, Homer and the Critique of Western Civilization. Book 12 is the last of the middle chapters where Odysseus has become the storyteller and is relaying all of his ex exploits to the Phaeacians. Uh, and so it continues on. But all of this is an unfolding of things we already know as readers, right? So the Cattle of the Sun chapter, we know from the beginning of the text that this is what uh, got Odysseus's men killed um, uh, because they were warned not to eat the Cattle of the Sun, um, the sun being Helios here, uh, and they did it anyway. But this is, of course, um, Odysseus um, tell, telling me, and so in the last book, we were in the underworld. He's come back from the underworld. This story continues right on from book 12, or sorry, sorry from book 11. Um, now, when our ship had left the ocean river rolling in her wake and launched out to open sea with its long swells to reach the island of Aea, East where the dawn forever young has come home and dancing rings and the sun his risings. Heading in and we beached our craft on the sands, the crews swung out on the low sloping shore, and there we fell asleep, awaiting dawn's first light. As soon as dawn with her rose red fingers shone again, I dispatched some men to Circe's halls to bring the dead Elpenor's body. So first thing Odysseus does is that he remembers the funeral funeral rites. Remember he met Elpenor in the underworld. Remember that Elpenor died earlier um, getting himself drunk um, on Circe's roof and then he f falls in the morning when the men are getting up to go. Uh, and so he doesn't die this um, glorious death in battle too. I think that that's important. Um, and his shade comes to Odysseus first thing in the underworld, even the uh, Odysseus is supposed to wait to talk to Tiresias first. There's this bit, little bit of an exchange um, that Elpenor has. Uh, nevertheless, Odysseus is good on his word um, first thing. So they give him a funeral uh, and that, that that becomes, I, I think, an important part of this if we're thinking of Odysseus as a kind of culture hero or he, founding the, the kinds of cultural practices um, that are going to be important for the Greeks. Um, and then after that, you know, the men um, go off and they eat a bunch of cattle or they eat a bunch of animals, which is kind of like what they do, you know, between just about everything. They um, have a bunch of wine and they drink, they, uh, um, slaughter some animals and, and chill out. Uh, and Odysseus, you know, kind of goes off with Circe and they make love and do the things that they, they, they do. Um, uh, Circe then advises him on the rest of his journey. And so the first thing she advises him on is the Sirens, famous, famous image from this text. Um, your descent to the dead is over true, but listen closely to what I tell you now, and God himself will bring it back to mind. First, you will raise the, isle raise the island of the sirens, those creatures who spellbind any man alive, whoever comes their way, whoever draws too close, off guard and catches the sirens' voices in the air. No sailing home for him, no wife rising to meet him, no happy children beaming up, at their father's face, the high, thrilling song of the sirens will transfix him, lulling there in the meadow, round them heaps of corpses, rotting away, rags of skin shriveling on the bones. Race straight past that coast, soften some beeswax and put stop, and stop your shipmates' ears so none can hear, um, none of the crew, but if you are bent on hearing, have them tie you, you hand and foot to the swift ship erect at the mast block lashed by ropes to the mast so you can hear the siren's song to your heart's content. But if you plead commanding your 
men to set you free, they must lash you faster, rope on rope. Um, and so we get this, this is the warning. And, and the idea, I, I read that out because I think it's important to note that the idea doesn't come from Odysseus here. Um, it doesn't come from his smarts that uh, um, puts the beeswax um, just in his shipmates' ears. Um, then she warns them about um, this narrow passage between the Scylla um, and the Charybdis, Charybdis, however you want to say it. Um, uh, she says that the only ship to have made it through before was um, the Argo. Uh, and um, so on one side of this this passage there is this steep rock face it's unclimbable there's a cave um, and in the cave lurks the monster Scylla um, she has 12 legs all writhing dangling down and six long swaying necks a hideous head on each each head barbed with a triple row of fangs thick set packed tight and the armed to the hilt with black death. Hold up in the cavern's bowels from her waist down, she shoots out her heads at that terrifying pit, out of that terrifying pit, angling right from her nest, wildly sweeping the reefs for dolphins, dogfish, or any bigger quarry she can drag from thousands of amphitrite spawns in the groaning seas. No mariners can yet can boast They've raced their ship past Scylla's lair without some mortal blow. With each of her six heads, she snatches up a man from the dark-powered craft and whisks him off. On the other side, we have um, the Charybdis, which is kind of a whirlpool um, that gulps the water down. Three times a day, she vomits it up. Three times, she gulps it down, that terror. Don't be there when the whirlpool swallows down. Not even the earthquake god could save you from disaster. No, hug Scylla's crag, sail on past her uh, top speed. So you got to sail your ship by the crag and, and risk um, Scylla eating your, your sailors um, because otherwise the whole ship goes down. Um, and Odysseus kind of fights back here. He wants to have glory. He wants to find a, a way to beat both, right? Uh, and then he immediately gets a, a warning um, from uh, from Circe, so stubborn the lovely goddess countered, hell bent yet again on battle and feats of arms. Can't you bow to the deathless gods themselves? Skill is no mortal. She's an immortal devastation, terrible, savage, wild. No fighting her, no defense. Just flee the creature. That the on that's the only way. Waste any time arming for battle beside her rock. I fear she'll lunge out again with all her six heads and seize as many men. No, row for your lives. Invoke brute force, I tell you. Skill is mother. She spawned her to scourge mankind. She can stop the monster's next attack. Um, and so then she, she warns that they'll get to the island of Thrinacia. Um, and she says explicitly, leave the beasts unharmed, your mind set on home, and you may still reach Ithaca. Bent with hardship, true, but ha harm them in any way. And I can see it now. Your ship destroyed, your men destroyed as well. And if even if you escape, you'll come home late, all shipmates lost, and come a broken man. Uh, and so then Odysseus rounds up his crew, and he tells them, he warns the, 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 the crew as well, um, uh, what's going to happen. Um, uh, so he tells them, I alone want to hear the voices of the sirens. Um, or I, I alone was to hear their voices, so she, so she said, but you must bind me with tight chafing ropes so I cannot move a muscle bound to the spot, erect at the mast block, lashed by ropes to the mast. And if I plead commanding you to set me free, then lash me faster, 
rope on pressing rope. And so we get uh, Odysseus and his men, and just the retelling of the narrative going through the, um, uh, the sirens. Um, and then uh, uh, the theme had already been introduced, but we get a, a flirtation with ignoring <laughs> Circe's, um, uh, uh, what Circe has to say, um, uh, and he wants to fight the monster. Um, uh, he said, and this is a point where he doesn't tell his men everything that's going on. So Odysseus is wily. He's, he knows he's going to be sacrificing some of his men for his own survival, right? Um, uh, he's saying, keep her clear of that smoke and surging breakers. Head for those crags or she'll catch you off guard. She'll yaw over there. You'll plunge us all in ruin. So I shouted, they snapped to each command. No mention of Scylla, how to fight that nightmare. For, the, the, for fear the men would panic, desert their oars, and huddle down and stow themselves away. But, I now, but now I cleared my mind of Circe's orders, cramping my style, urging me not to arm at all. I donned my heroic armor, seized long spears in both my hands, and marched out on the half-deck forward, hoping for... From there to catch the first glimpse of Scylla, ghoul of the cliffs, swooping to kill my men. But nowhere could I make her out, and my eyes ached scanning from the mist-bound rock face top to bottom. Uh, and then, um, of course, um, uh, the Scylla, the men are all have their eyes fixed on the, on the Charybdis, and Scylla comes out, snatches six of them immediately, um, uh, and we get a really nice simile here around line 271, 272. Just as an angler poised on a jutting rock flings his treacherous bait off in the offshore swell, whips his long rod, hook sheathed in the oxhorn lure, and whisks up little fish he flips on the beach break, writhing, grasping, gasping out their lives. So now they writhed, gasping as Scylla swung them up her cliff there at her cavern's mouth. She bolted them down bra, screaming out, flinging their arms toward me, lost in that mortal struggle. Of all the pitiful things I've had to witness, suffering, searching out the wit pathways of the sea, this wrenched my heart most. Uh... And then um, they make it through there, um, and uh, he it remembers the words of Tiresias. I was struck once more by the words of the blind demon prophet Tiresias and um, Aeaean Circe too. Time and again they told me to shun the island of the sun, the joy of man. So they get there, um, and he well, well first of all Odysseus wants to pass by, and Eurylochus who's been a complainer for a while now, complains um, that they, they need to stop, they need to rest. And Odysseus says, okay, we can stop and rest, but only if you do not touch any of the cattle if they're there. Um, and the men swear to do so. Um, and that works for a while. It works for about a month, but then there's no favorable winds. So um, they use up all of their food on the ship, and then um, the men are starving. And Odysseus has told them not to slay the cattle. Um, uh, so we've had this kind of theme showing up. Um, the theme of the sirens goes back to the theme of the lotus eaters. The things that will draw us into these islands and make us languish there and stop acting at all. Um, and then the things that do act or the actions that happen and sometimes Odysseus goes ahead with his away team and sometimes he sends his away team ahead instead of himself um, but it seems like when he goes off on his own um, oftentimes something something um, bad happens um, there's a comparable thing as I was rereading this for um, preparation today. I, I, I think that we could very much compare this to the Moses story of going up um, on top of the mountain 
of Mount Sinai to talk to God and then coming back. And of course, all of his people are worshiping um, the golden calf, right? Um, so there's that theme of, of, of um, the people not being able to lead themselves and they need someone like Odysseus. Um, so, um, uh, so uh, as the tale goes, um, but for one whole month, the south wind blew, blew nonstop. No other wind came up, but none but the south, southeast. As long as our food and ready wine held out, the crew eager to save their lives kept hands off the herds. But then when the supplies had all run dry, when the men turned to hunting, forced to range for quarry and twisted hooks, for fish, birds, anything that they could lay their hands on, hunger racked their bellies, I struck inland up the island there to pray to the gods. If only one might show me some way home, crossing into the heartland, clear of the crew, I rinsed my hands in this sheltered spot, a windbreak. But soon as I prayed to all the gods who rule Olympus, down on my eyes, they poured a sweet sound sleep. So he falls asleep, this kind of um, dream that he enters into. And as he does so, Yuri Lachis convinces the men to eat the cattle. Um, and he says, you know, we'll eat them, but once we'll promise that once we get home, we'll erect a, once a glorious temple to the sun god. Um, and so we get not only that Yuri Lachis is kind of this foil or a counter character to Odysseus, but um, we get uh, uh, the idea that only some people can make these kinds of agreements with the gods. Um, and uh, where you're going to bargain and do a sacrifice later, such as the sacrifice, if we think about comparing it to um, the sacrifice with Tiresias, right? Before going into the underworld, um, there's the sacrifice of some animals. And then there's also the promise that on his return, when he gets back to Ithaca, he will slaughter the biggest black bull um, just for Tiresias, right? Um, and that's a power that Yuri Lachis does not have, right? Uh, so his prayers are not heard. They kill the son's cattle. Um, and Odysseus is horrified. Uh, that moment, soothing slumber fell from my eyes. And down I went to our ship at the water's edge. But on my way, nearing the long beak beaked craft, the smoky savor of roasts came floating up around me. I groaned in anguish, crying out to the deathless gods, Father Zeus, the rest of you blissful gods who never die, with you with your fatal sleep, you lulled me into disaster. Left on their own, look what a monstrous thing my crew concocted. Uh, Helios notices the cattle gone and also complains to Zeus. Um, and so Zeus vows to kill them. Uh, so, um, uh, and Odysseus says, or so I heard it from the lovely nymph Calypso, who heard it herself, she said from Hermes, the god of guides. It's just an interesting moment in the text where um, Odysseus realizes that he's telling the story and then he also says, well, how could I have known about that? And so um, he traces it back to a source. Um, so he's uh, interested in the idea of reliability of his narrative there. <clears throat> uh, um, and so uh, as soon as they reached our ship on the water's edge, um, so they, they take off on the ship, the, the, the winds die down. Um, uh, and once they're out at sea, then Zeus sends this massive storm um, that sinks the ship. Um, uh, for Odysseus, though, uh, I went lurching along our battered hulk till the sea surge ripped the plankings from the keel and the waves swirled it away, stripped bare and snapped the mast from the decks. But a back stay made of bull's hide still held fast, and with this I lashed the mast and keel together, made them one, riding my makeshift raft as the wretched gale winds bore me on and on. At last the west wind quit its wild rage, but the south came on at once to hound me even more, making me double back over my route toward the cruel um, uh, Charybdis. All night long I was rushed back in, and then at break of day I reached the crag of Scylla, 
and the diacarbed um, vortex right when the dreadful water whirlpool gulps the salt sea down. And so he jumps up, right, um, heaving myself aloft to clutch at the fig tree's height. Like a bat, I clung to its trunk for dear life, not a chance for good firm foothold there, no clambering up either, the roots too far to reach, the boughs too high overhead, huge swaying branches that overshadowed the carved disc. And he hangs there, um, and we get a nice simile here. Oh, how I ached for both, um, uh, uh, sorry, waiting for her vo to vomit up my mast and keel back up again. Oh, how I ached for both. And came, back they came, late but last, at just the hour of a judge at court, who settled the countless suits of brash young claimants, rises, um, the day's work done, and turns home for supper. It's just th this interesting image, right, for that, like, um, uh, of the judge at court who's been hearing cases all day. Um, just at, at um, uh, at just the hour a judge at court who settled the countless suits of brash young claimants rises, the day's work done, and turns home for supper. That's when the timbers reared back from the car of dis. Um, and then he drifts nine days again. This is a theme that shows up again and again. And on the 10th at night, he reaches Ogigia. Um, which, of course, is Calypso's island, and we've already heard that story. That was the story that he began with when he um, started talking to the Phaeacians. And so we see there's a kind of cyclical um, storytelling here. Um, there was definitely the retreat to the underworld in Book 11, where we got a lot of mythology. We got a lot of other um, uh, intertextual stories going on, like Orion, Heracles... Tiresias, Tantalus, um, Syphilis, um, or sorry, Syphilis, Sisyphus, um, and uh, um, uh, and, th and then we've come back to the real world. There was still this kind of mini moment where Odysseus has gone to sleep and dreamed, and during that time his men have done something horrible and they've brought about their own death. And so I want to just sort of pause here and think about um, dreams themselves um, and um, this moment in um, one way of, of looking at mythology in terms of mythological criticism is a psychoanalytic approach um, uh, and uh, this is something that that Otto Rank, um, a famous um, uh, uh, German scholar, excuse me, let me just reach his book here um, uh, uh, writes about in um, an old book now from the early 19 teens, um, uh, The Myth of the Birth of the Hero, A Psychological Interpretation of Mythology. And um, uh, we'll have more to say about mythological criticism in my next sort of installment where I break out of the contextualized readings here. But while I'm on this moment of thinking about about dreams there was one passage here it's really early on in his book i was thinking about and he says um the manifestation of the intimate relation between dream and myth not only in regard to the contents but also as to the form and motor forces of this and many other more particular pathological psyche structures entirely justifies the interpretation of the myth as a dream of the masses of people, which I've recently shown elsewhere. And he refers to another book of his called um, Der Künstler. Um, uh, Otto Rank is not the only person to make these kinds of claims, and he's talking you know, in context there about Sigmund Freud. Um, but I think that this is an interesting uh, thing to be thinking about in terms of our broader context of thinking of Homer in the critique of Western civilization, because um, the Euro-Christian mind, remember for me, that's all one word, lowercase, it's a, uh, a social movement, not just a religion of Christianity. Um, but in the Euro-Christian imagination, that 
sees itself as coming in some sort of a lineage of Western civilization that goes back to the Greeks, um, there is this look, a constant searching for origins. Um, it, of course, um, really, really emerges in the 19th century, which is a time period where scholars um, are obsessed with the idea of the origins of cultures. Um, uh, we've seen the the um, arising of, of various forms of nationalism in the 19th century. Um, and of course, that's uh, at the height of colonialism. Um, so European powers are, try are going and looking at and analyzing through what Michel Foucault calls knowledge power. Um, uh, the stories of the peoples that they have dominated and they've been trying to sort of systematize it into uh, notions of comparative world religions or comparative mythology so that they can get this kind of linear um, progressive account for the development of human nature and of human cultural life uh, and they can't reconcile it all the time <laughs> the Europeans are um, uh, obsessed um, from the time that they so-called discover that's a technical term right discovery um, uh, the the continent the continents that we now call North and South America um, they are trying to find an account for how these indigenous people got there <laughs> because it doesn't work with their um, the stories of their Judeo-Christian origins and they really are racking their brains for several centuries about this and and in some cases there's still argument about how people got here uh, one of the things that arises with the psychological interpretation of myths is that you know uh, if we think about Mayan people developing their own forms of writing about simultaneously to what's going on in uh, the Middle East um, or over um, near uh, Acadia or the uh, um, Acadian culture um, uh, between you know uh, Iraq and uh, India if we compare that to Mayan cultures for example in Mesoamerica or um, we think about what other kinds of forms of writing like quipus in South America for example which um, uh, I, I don't think that uh, we figured out a whole lot about but there is the quipu project over at Harvard um, uh, where they're trying to analyze um, how these rope devices are um, being used as a form of writing um, uh, definitely different um, notions of writing that than, than we might be used to um, but uh, scholars are always trying to to rack their brains um, to think about about how um, technology develops in human cultures. Um, a great deal of mythology has emphasized the worshiping of the sun, for example, um, uh, and solstices in ancient archaeology and architecture, right? That deals with issues of the sun, places like Stonehenge um, and things like that. So. Uh, um, and, and the idea that, of course, that, that, that we do see um, uh, attention to the constellation called the Big Dipper, for example, um, uh, with, as a bear um, that can show up in um, uh, indigenous cultures from the Americas, but as well as um, cultures um, from Asia or Eurasia uh, and Africa. And so uh, there is this obsession that Euro-Christian culture has of trying to tell uh, in a kind of linear way the human story and indigenous peoples of the Americas kind of like throw them off all the time in terms of how they temporalize and, and tell that story. Uh, out of those debates, the psychological critique um, developed that said that, you know, you don't necessarily have to have this direct cross influence of one human culture to another because what's going on in uh, human storytelling is something that's happening at the level of the development of our psyche itself. And therefore, if we can focus on that, then we don't need to find this like direct causal historical record of one 
people who comes into contact with another people who comes into contact with another people. Uh, so I want to emphasize that that is one of when psychological criticism developed, that was the comp part, at least one part of the context itself. Now it develops into all sorts of other things in Carl Jung and archetype theory and, and all sorts of stuff that I'm not going to go into in this lecture, but I just wanted to point that out here because we've seen that, you know, uh, in, in mythological theory that, that Odysseus has become the storyteller in recent um, books here in the in the Odyssey, um, but there's also the theme of Odysseus the dreamer, Odysseus the one who falls asleep while his men eat the cattle of the god of the sun, or Odysseus as being the one who goes down and mingles with the dead people, um, and so there is this kind of uh, 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 journeying that he does in not just body but in mind and psyche and what's emerging from that are all of these cultural mores um, uh, that arise. And that, of course, for the people who are the de defenders of the Western civilization narrative, um, that's the stuff that they want to value as well. Uh, and so if we're going to critique the Western civilization narrative, I think that uh, we need to be very careful with the ways, especially that psychological discourse has developed or psychoanalytic discourse, which goes beyond just poo-pooing Freud and Jung. I think um, there are important things to uh, think about in terms of the context of Freud and Jung historically, in terms of theory and criticism uh, that are worth understanding. Um, but of, and it's also not to say that that those theories are in any way sort of current for us in 2022. It's just something that we need to think about in terms of a longer development or a meta discussion, a theoretical discussion of discourse on myths and mythology that becomes important because myths are supposed to be this kind of background texture. Um, uh, in Ferdinand de Saussure's terms, linguistic terms, um, myths operate more like long language at large versus speech, which is language in the moment. And that big division between long and parole, between language, a entire language, which, you know, I don't know every single word in English language, right? But um, uh, it's the my native language. It's what I was born with. And um, so it exists outside of me and it also is the vehicle from which through which I express myself. Uh, um, Claude Levi-Strauss, a huge mythological critic, anthropologist, um, took Ferdinand de Saussure's ideas about linguistics and then applied them to mythology. It's worth its own lectures and, and he wrote many books so I can't go into too much of it there. but as just we to make this moment of pause where we're going to now maneuver in the second half of the odyssey right like we've already gotten odysseus's main adventures his wondrous adventures and now um he's going to start making his way um home to meet his son um, and back to ithaca to deal with the suitors as well remember at the end we've been told that that's not the end of the book either right that the, or the end of Odysseus's story he then needs to go after the dealing with the suitors he needs to go um, far far inland to where he meets people who have not had any contact with the ocean and there he's supposed to make a sacrifice to po Poseidon um, and that is going to be um, uh, the fulfillment of, of, of um, dealing with Poseidon's rage so we'll see if we get there Maybe I won't do spoilers on that um, for for this part of the text. Um, uh, but I, all, I say all of that just to say that, that I think that the conventional ways that people think about the Odyssey um, as a story is they just, first of all, they just focus on Odysseus and his exploits, like Odysseus with the sirens, Odysseus and the cattle of the gods, Odysseus and the monster of the Charybdis, or something like that, right? Well, those, those are the images that stick out to people's minds, but when we look at the actual structure of 
the Odyssey, there's quite a bit more going on. As I've said over and over again, the first four books are just about Telemachus before Odysseus even shows up. And then we get some stuff um, about Odysseus and the Phaeacians, but then we get him becoming the storyteller, going to the land of the dead, and now finishing his stories. He's impressed the Phaeacians, we know that. And now we're going to see in the next book has um, how he starts his way home. Thanks for paying attention um, and listening to these lectures, watching these lectures. Uh, we'll see you again, uh, metaphorically anyway, uh, for book 13, Ithaca at last, um, in another video. Have a great day or night or morning, wherever you are. Bye.